Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Guarding into Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Tree borers can wreak havoc on your landscape. Today, we're going to learn all about these insects. Also, plants are great and so are pets, but there are some plants that are dangerous for Fido and Fluffy. That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Guarding into Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Frank Hale, Dr. Frank, is a UT Extension entomologist, and Joellen Diamond will be joining us later. Hi, Doc. How are you doing, Chris? How are you doing today? Well, I'm pretty happy. I brought all my wood boring <laughs> insect all display. This. Yeah. All right. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about those tree borers. Yeah. Uh, why are wood boring insects important? They right. can actually cause the de decline of a tree or even the death of a tree. Okay. They're tunneling into the wood. They might be feeding underneath the bark, and they're actually injuring the, the tree. And often you think of them as nature's way to decompose a tree while it's still standing. Okay. They usually <laughs> go after weakened trees or declining trees, but there's some pests we have will go after trees that look apparently pretty healthy. Okay. So what happens when you see a hole in a branch or in a trunk of the tree? Can you see these holes here? This is a camphor shot borer. It's a ambrosia beetle from, uh, from Asia. Mm. It came over here. And when you see holes in the tree, that means that beetle's been in there probably a year wow, or even longer. Okay. That means those are the exit holes. Okay. So that indicates, now a lot of people get uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker and other woodpeckers yeah. uh, holes uh, confused, but these are more random where the uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker more encircles the trunk of the tree. Right. Okay. But ambrosia beetles, when they when they tunnel in, just think of somebody with a drill. They drill straight in the tree and then make a right or left turn. So <laughs> I split these twigs, and once inside the plant, then they inoculate it with a fungi. And the white ambrosial fungi is what the larvae feed on. Oh, okay. So they make their own little mushroom garden inside your tree. Oh. And that can be a big problem. Often in late winter, early spring, we'll see the granulate ambrosia beetle. And as you can see here, the beetle will have these little toothpick-like mm -hmm. frass tubes. Seen As that. they tunnel in, they eject out the, the sawdust-like frass, and okay. you'll see these little things maybe an inch long or so. And if you touch them, they just disintegrate. Right. So to protect against these, you have to put a protective insecticide spray on the, uh, the bark of the tree. So now, when, would you, when would you do that? Well, for ambrosia beetle, like the granulate ambrosia beetle, we do that when, it, when we get those first 70 degree temperature days in late winter, early spring. Okay. The beetles start flying then and become active. And we actually put out traps baited with ethyl alcohol. Mm. They go right to it because a stressed tree releases ethyl uh -huh. alcohol and they'll go to the trap. And so we all usually tell our county agents when the, the beetles are flying so they can get the word out. Okay. Yeah. Every year we also see clear wing borers. Mm -hmm. Now this, you can see these round holes, clear wing size. borers, yeah. and here is actually the, the uh, lilac borer, you can see it, or a banded ash clear wing, I think it's the lilac borer. It also attacks ash trees, lilac and ash. This is a native clear wing borer, so it's actually a moth. It flies around during the day, it's a day flying moth, mm -hmm. and uh, you'll lay its egg. Other uh, clear wing borers would be the dogwood borer, yeah. the peach tree borer, let me show you some, the, what these moths actually look like. Yeah, that's neat. They're called clear wings because they don't have all the wing covered with scale. Okay. And so they mimic bees and wasps and little, they flit around in the sunshine like you would see a bee. Hmm. And so predators kind of leave them alone. They're not going to mess with a bee. They don't want to get attacked, so to speak. <laughs> Sometimes uh, we don't think of uh, the peach tree borer will attack plants in the genus Prunus, which includes cherry laurel or Otolucan laurel. So this is the trunk of one, and you can see wow. that it has totally been, if I turn it around here, here's the actual moth, lays its egg on the trunk, the caterpillar then feeds underneath the bark, and you can see here all the bark yeah. has been, has got off the, you know, fallen off. So this girdles the plant and kills it. Okay. The, the water can't go up and down the tree. 
So that's, uh, that, that actually killed the plant. We have some other uh, uh, beetles, they're called, let me move this out of the way, these are called metallic wood boring beetles, yeah, and the larvae are called flat-headed borers. And the, so the larvae gets underneath the bark again, and as you can see here on this, this uh, tree trunk, it kind of makes a spiral as it goes and feeds underneath. Kills that cambial tissue. So the beetles come out, they often lay their eggs on the sunny part of the side of the tree, south or southwest side in the spring, and then the caterpillars are underneath. And they're gonna be underneath the tree for a year or so. Wow. And then they'll come out the next year usually. Sometimes you'll, the, we have a new pest, it's a, uh, called the emerald ash oh, borer. Boy. It's from China. Yeah. And it got over here in 2010, we found it in Knoxville area. And now it's in Middle Tennessee, uh -oh. and it's heading this way. It's this I don't way. know if it's—I yeah. don't think it's been found here yet okay. in West Tennessee, but you can see here. This is the the wood of the tree underneath the bark, and it look you see these meandering tunnels. That's where the flat-headed borer larvae. It's kind of flattened, and it can live there, and it feeds feeds on the uh, uh, cambial tissue. Mm -hmm. So that's the water conducting tissue, the growth ring uh, tissue that uh, allows the plant to grow. So this will, within a few years, kill the tree also. Wow. So we're really gonna lose probably most all of our ash trees, native ash trees in North America. Uh, this, the little pink shows here where, where there's a D-shaped exit hole. I just painted it pink so it'd show up better. Okay. It's kind of hard to see on the bark. So we did that to accent it. But that means that that beetle had been in there a year and it emerged in the spring. So we generally use systemic insecticides. To, if there's a tree, like an ash tree, that you want to preserve in your front yard and side yard, a real nice tree, you can uh, treat it with uh, uh, tree injection products like triage or we can uh, drench around the roots okay. with systemic, systemic. insecticides. Uh, so can you, you can, can you kill use those as a preventative, though? Well, we, I would, we don't recommend uh, using the insecticides. They're a little expensive okay. until you actually have these cited yeah. in your county. Okay. Once they're in your county, you can start protecting it. Okay. So I wouldn't do anything right now. There's no need to. Right. But if you notice trees in general with wood boring insects, they're going to start to see some branch die back mm -hmm. in the top of the tree first. You'll see a thinner canopy, fewer leaves. Mm -hmm. You might even, with the emerald ash borer, you might even see uh, uh, epicormic sprouts that are at the base of the oh, tree. Okay. So it's putting up all these little sprouts because the top of the tree is just starting to die. Okay. So you really want to treat this though early before there's much damage if you want to preserve the tree. Okay. Gotcha. I just wanted to show you here is uh, we made a nice little display showing the emerald ash borer. The beetle is right here, the beetles. They're not very big at all. No, they're not. Um, but they're, metal they're metallic green, emerald color. The larvae are what do most of the damage, and they're elongated, might be an inch or so long, uh, kind of cream colored. So this is really ecological disaster. It's going to kill most wow. of the ash trees in North America. And that, uh, it got over here. Once it got here, we couldn't do much about it because it already started to spread. People actually cut down trees, move firewood. So that's why it's important not to bring firewood yeah. into our state parks from up. elsewhere. Right. Uh, a, a pest we don't have in Tennessee and we don't want is the <laughs> Asian longhorn beetle. It's okay. one of the round-headed borers. This is also, you can see it has the real long antennae. That's mm -hmm. why it's called longhorn beetles. We have native longhorn beetles, but this one likes to attack maple trees mm. and buckeye trees okay. and horse chestnut. So we have you know millions of, of, of yeah, uh, maple yeah. trees. We don't need a wood boring pest. No. The, the closest infestation is Claremont County, Ohio, east of Cincinnati, Ohio, but north of the Ohio River. Okay. They're trying to eradicate that right now and doing a pretty good job. So whenever this is found, we actually go in and try to eradicate it because it could do a lot of damage. Wow, that's some good stuff. Yeah, there's, there's just uh, lots, and, and we really tell people that, uh, when it comes to wood boring insects, you have to ha have some preventative sprays. When you plant a new tree and you put it in the ground, you want to drench it with an insecticide for, for pests like round-headed borers, flat-headed borers, 
uh, those beetle uh, bores, that okay. will protect them. Other uh, type bores, like clear wing bores, you'll have to put a trunk spray. But we have all that information at UT Extension Publications. Sure. Uh, we can check out uh, PB1589. Okay. It has a lot of information. Look at this, you already know the number. That's pretty good. Thank you, Doc. That was good information. Thank you, Chris. Good stuff, good stuff. Well, let's get to translocation since you mentioned that earlier when we were talking about systemic. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. You know, and when we think about translocation, that's just movement, just movement. throughout the mm -hmm. plant. That's all that means. Mm -hmm. Stuff that's translocated. Mm -hmm. And usually it's through the uh, vascular system of the plant, you mm -hmm. know, through the, like our arteries and veins, which is, you know, we'll throw out a couple more big terms, phloem <laughs> and xylem. <laughs> right. That's right. And I always remember xylem is zahai. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It takes water up. Yeah. Okay. It's hard. Sometimes it's hard to you remember which uh -huh. one's which. I always yeah. have to kind of think about it. One's moving up, and one's moving down. Yeah, one is moving down. Yep. Yeah, I remember that from yeah, classes. How yep. about that? All right, Joellen. Plants to avoid around pets. Really? Yeah, ah. pets. Yeah. Okay. I, I have a couple of pets that actually like to eat some. Yeah, one of them likes to eat tomatoes, <laughs> and that's on the list of no, you don't eat. To oh, tomatoes for, for dogs. So Chevy eats tomatoes. Chevy eats tomatoes. Well, Glory. Well, Glory eats, uh, she will run in the backyard and she grabs some uh, of my perennials oh. and she'll chew on and eat them before I say, stop, stop, stop. But it, luckily it's not on this list. So Good. I'm Good. Not worry. All right. So let's find out what's on the list then. Let's find out what's All on right. the list. We're going to go through an some annuals first. Sure. Uh, begonias, believe it or not. Oh. Begonias are on the list. Coleus. Oh. A lot of these are common plants, forget-me-nots, and there's a lot of uh -huh. seed of that that people put out. Geraniums, oh. lantana. Really? And lantana has a liver toxicity with it with for pets. So wow. that's a that's not Didn't a good one. That. Some larkspur and and of course the Christmas poinsettia. Right. I mean it, it you can, some people will plant it outside and so it it'd be a possibility that pets could get around it. And if the leaves fall off of it inside you know, it, during the Christmas holidays, you don't want your pets to eat those okay. either. Oh. So be careful with that. Then there's, of course, the perennials. Now, the, and there are, there are more on a list than this, but I'm going to go into the ones that are most common. Some of the perennials are Asclepius, which everybody plants as the butterfly oh, weed right, right. for the monarchs. Well, that's fine, but if your pets get a hold of it, it's not good for them either. So keep it away. Uh, carnations is another <laughs> one, oh, Dianthus. Uh, chrysanthemums, of course, that makes sense because there's uh, chemicals for ki kill insects right, made with right. chrysanthemums, so you know right. that wouldn't be good for, you know, Fido or Fluffy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then there's dahlias. Dahlias aren't good for, okay. for animals. Uh, daisies. Daisies. And foxglove. Now, foxglove is probably you're going to see it out blooming in the nurseries and stuff, but re just remember that that is cardiotoxic chemicals in it which affects hearts of ah, the yeah, pets. Cardio, huh? Yeah, cardio. Oh, so it's that. cardio toxic, don't, don't, don't get those. Iris is another one. Uh, Lenten rose, some of my Lenten favorites. Milk, yeah, milk. no, it, and that's evergreen. It's gonna be around all the time, but don't let your pets chew on it. Uh, Lily of the Valley and May apples. You know, the out in the yeah, woods. Yeah, yeah if you're, that don't let Fido or Fluffy <laughs> eat on those either. <laughs> Peonies that have just finished blooming. Oh, Those are also on the list. And yarrow. Yeah, okay. And then we're going to move into herbs, vegetables, and fruits. Wow, you shocked me already with this. I know. Sort of this is this is like a uh, 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 alliums. Okay. Garlics Garlic. and onions, right. you know, and then ornamental ones. Don't let them chew on okay. those either. And of course, then there's apples, cherries, plums. The seeds of all of those are have cyanide in them. So that's not good. And a lot of people will let them fall, you know, on the ground, leave them on the ground. Yeah. That's when the animals can oh, get yeah. a hold of them. Mm -hmm. But besides that, even the leaves and the stems are not good because they have chemicals in them that are toxic oh, to animals. Yeah. So just think about it. If you want to toss a stick, or <laughs> the, you know, there's lo loose sticks in the yard, and the you know yeah. animals go and catch them and try to play, you know, they tear them up. It's not good because. Those are not good trees Ouch. to have around for your pets. Oh, man. 
Uh, citrus fruit too. Now, citrus fruit, a lot of people have citrus fruits that they bring in and outside around here. Okay, yeah. And so uh, those are not good. The, the fruit, the actual fruit themselves is okay. It's the coating of the waxy coating around and even the leaves and the stems, again. Right. Uh, is not good for them. Like your lemon and lime. Oh, wow. Okay. I know. Wow. And then, of course, grapes and yeah. uh, raisins. Oh. Also, oh. in fact, those are uh, can cause a su acute kidney failure in dogs and cats. Wow. So be careful with those. Mm. And a mint family. You know, you plant a mint, it get, gets really big. Sure. Those are not good for your pets either. Uh, peppers, not good for your pets. And of course, tomatoes, like we talked yeah, about with before. All the tomatoes. Aloe vera is not good either. And it's good for us, good for but it's us, not good for your pets. And of course, there's a lot of other spices that are, are not good for your pets. And just think about it, when you're cooking, you use these spices and you want to, you know, Fido gets a bite or the cat gets a bite. Well, if it's got some of the spices that they don't need to have in the herbs, you know, you're not doing a, your dog a favor by giving them those. So yeah, just be careful, uh, just be careful. Because, of course, I'm thinking about cat mint. Well, yeah, cat mint. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but believe it or not, parsley is also one of the things that you cannot give oh, animals. Wow. It's not good for them. Good now for caterpillars, but not, not yeah. Not. <laughs> All right. So we'll go on to Ooh. bulbs. Yeah. Amaryllis, caladiums. Yeah, of course, yeah. there's a lot of problems with caladiums. Even people have problems yeah. with caladiums. Crocus, daffodils. Yeah. You know, daffodils are deer, deer resistant. Well. You know, your pets shouldn't be eating daffodils either. Oh. Gladiolas that are getting ready to bloom or starting to bloom. Those are not good for your pets. Hyacinths. And a lot of the lilies, they're not all the lilies, but a lot of the lilies are bad. And a tulips, not good. And tulips, wow. Don't, don't okay. let them eat those either. Okay. Some of the vines that aren't good. Vines? Clematis, English in Boston ivy is not good for pets. And that's, you know, that you could have that all over your yard. Yes. Ah, morning glory uh, and wisteria. And you know, and you wisteria. find wisteria in the, the woods yeah. and the, the seeds and pods and stuff. Don't let your dogs and cats play with those. Golly, okay. Yeah. Then shrubs. 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 <laughs> Azaleas and rhododendrons. And in fact, if they, they're, they are one of the cardio toxins again. Okay. And if just Parts. a few azalea leaves can be toxic to your Ooh. dog. Yeah, not good. Boxwood, burning bush, the euonymus, uh. that's not good. Gardenia, those are not good for pets. Yeah. Hydrangeas, and hydrangeas are getting ready to bloom. Yes. They are also cardiotoxic. So that affects their heart too, Ooh. as is Japanese pieris. That is okay. also a cardiotoxic plant to have around. Ah. And of course, one thing they're gonna encounter just almost everywhere is privet. And how many, <laughs> privet is not good for dogs it's and like cats pit, either. Right. <laughs> I don't know how you can get away with that. I mean, it's in the woods, it's everywhere, right. but it's not good for them to eat. But how many times have you, you know, seen people, you know, getting rid of the privet and the sticks yeah, are around and yeah. the dogs are running around the neighborhood, that's not good for your pet. Uh, and then of course oak trees, the oak, the acorns are not good mm. for your dogs to ingest. And I actually caught one of my dogs with, you know, I said, what are you chewing on? I opened up their mouth and there's an acorn. I'm like, stop oh, eating that? stuff like that. <laughs> I don't know why, but they do it. And that's, that's one of the things to watch out for. So just, just watch your pets, you know, Ooh. be careful and, and observe them. Don't just let them out there and, and you know, for them to themselves and don't watch what they're doing. Right. Uh, the best list that wow. there is around of toxic and non-toxic plants is on the ASPCA.org website. They have long okay. lists of things to look at because this is just the most common ones that I've picked out. Okay, and we'll have a link to that, but those are just the most common. Those are the most common. That's a lot of common. It's a lot of common plants, plants. that I have in my yard. Right. That a lot of people A know, lot of people have yards. in their yard. That's why I say, well, see, you notice I caught my dogs, oh, you know, when they were doing stuff. So I knew what they were, you know, ingesting or trying to ingest. And I tried and I Ooh. stopped them. So that's what you've got to do. Pay attention to your pets. Pay attention. All right, Joel, that's good stuff. So we got to keep Fido and Fluffy safe, right? right keep them safe. Yeah, and Glory and, yeah, and Chevy. Chevy. Yeah. yeah. Got to keep them safe. Good stuff. All right. In agriculture, we have several different kinds of um, applicator tips for spray nozzles. 
and they all have different um, specific purposes. But for homeowners, what we're going to come into contact most often are um, these adjustable nozzles that are on one gallon pump up sprayers and uh, pump up backup. Uh, backpack sprayers. Um, they have basically two different ways that you can spray them. You've got a, a steady stream if you open up your sprayer nozzle all the way and uh, this is what that would look like. That type of application is going to be um, useful when you are trying to do like perimeter applications or if you're trying to reach high up into canopies of trees. Um, it's important for homeowners to know that a finer spray uh, has finer droplets and that actually provides better coverage. So if you're trying to um, get inside shrubbery and, and dense herbaceous plants, that's the type of spray you're going to want to use. And you can see how it covers a larger area and it's a finer mist and a finer droplet and that's what you want to use for adequate coverage. All right, so here's our Q&A segment. Y'all ready for these questions? We're ready. They're really yes. good questions. All right, here's our first viewer email. Please tell me what's eating my laurel bushes and hostas and more importantly, how to get rid of them. And this is from Heather from New Bern, Tennessee. All right. So what do we think that is, Ms. Joella? Uh, the, well, now. Let's look at the first one. Let's look at the yeah, laurel first. The laurel first. Okay. The, the and laurel, it's not an insect. It's not, a, it's not an insect. Right. Actually, it's a disease mm -hmm. called shot hole disease. Right. Very common on laurels. Right. All laurels get that. So, yeah. So this rainy weather we've had yes. is conducive yes. to that. Yes. Hopefully, yeah. when we get dries out a little in the summer, you'll see less of that. Hopefully you can prune so. some of that out as you do your routine pruning to right. shape the Thing. So that helps, but it's not going to kill the plant right. or anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Good airflow too, you know, especially if it's next to a wall or something right. like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of times people are not pruning and they're just topping. Yes. And so, you know, maybe when you prune, if you can go down to a, a shoot mm -hmm. and it kind of make some air movement for the plant, okay. that would help that too. Yeah. Practice good sanitation as well when those leaves hit the ground for sure. And you can just use a fungicide if you have to for that. All right. Mm -hmm. So, what about the hostas though? It's probably just a slug. It's just slugs. Right. I have hostas at home. They have damage. It kind of looks like that. Just slugs. <laughs> slugs and snails <laughs> like this kind of wet, rainy uh -huh. weather. And uh, we, we do have uh, uh, baits that you can put, put out for slugs. There's one that has metaldehyde in it. You have to be careful but yeah. around pets. So yeah. you don't want to okay. use metaldehyde baits. But uh, there's, an, I think, an iron uh, phosphate yeah, iron bait phosphate. that you can use. It's safer. Okay. But in general, uh, drier weather. It helps. gets better to dry weather helps. I'm surprised, you, I'm surprised you didn't mention the beer. No, no <laughs> beer is to be drunk, not <laughs> put out in little dishes for the yeah, slug. Yeah. <laughs> well, now I like to put just boards because oh, they have yeah. to go somewhere at, in the, you know, over in the morning. During the day, you just yeah. lay a board down, you pick up the board up in the morning, you see all of them, you scrape them, and you're done yeah. with the slugs and put your board back and catch some more. Well, that's a good idea. That's good. And it's funny because, yeah. All these things we're talking about, product of the environment, wet conditions. Yeah. How sure. about that? So there you have it, Heather. Thank you for the question. Here's our next viewer email. How do you keep ants out of your compost pile? And this is Wade in Ortigua, Tennessee. All right. So guess what, Wade? We have our butt guy well, here. So well, do we need to keep the ants out I don't, of I don't really pile? think you do because the whole idea of compost is to break it down. Uh -huh. And so insects, whether it's termites, ants, they're breaking down uh, wood often, uh -huh. like carpenter ants. So they're, that's part of the process. So okay. I, don't, I wouldn't worry about that at all. Okay. Some people use uh, black soldier flies to break down compost. Ah, the larvae will before. devour vegetable matter, especially if you have a big vegetable garden. And okay. then the larvae can be used for fish food. That's pretty cool. Ah. That wow. is good. How about that? Ah, okay. Yes. Good stuff. All right. And one other thing, though, if you turn your compost pile enough. Yeah, the ants won't want to be there. Yeah, you got to turn it to aerate it yeah. so it gets up then to we'll a proper temperature right. to kill right. the microbes. Right, right. Yeah, and the ants yeah. won't want to be there anyway because no, you're disturbing you... them too much. Yeah. That's right. All right. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. All right. So there you have it, Wade. Just get in there to disturb those ants, all right? And they're not bad. They're not bad in your compost pile. All right, so here's our next viewer email. I just bought a foul orchid and need to repot it from the tiny two inch container it came in. It has two nice, healthy, silvery white air roots about five inches long hanging over the side and several submerged in the potting media. 
When repotting orchids, should I put the air roots in the new potting medium or keep them in the air? And this is from Kate. So what say you, Ms. Joella? Ah, well, you, <laughs> you know, know about that, don't I you? I do know. Actually, I uh -huh. have a, one that I need to pot up myself. Uh -huh. So I have some of the potting medium that is uh, that you use for orchids. It's mostly just bark. It's very airy. And yes, I would put those roots down in this bark um, because they'll keep growing and sending up more. And it's probably a philanopsis mm -hmm. is what she's probably got that you can see, get by just about anywhere. Yeah, anywhere. I mean, exactly. and, and they like this kind of medium, and so I just say, you know, enjoy, but yeah, pot it all up. So pot it all up, Miss Kate. Pot it all up. So Joel and Doc, we're out of time. It's fun. It was lots of fun. Fun. More questions. <laughs> More questions. <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter the email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Having a problem with your garden? Go to familyplotgarden.com. We have over a thousand videos about all sorts of gardening issues. If we haven't talked about your problem, send us a question and we will answer it on the show. Be sure to join us next week for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.